In 2008, Jon Favreau's Iron Man was released in theaters, and with it began the dominance of the Marvel theatrical experience. The ramifications have been wide-reaching, chief amongst them the slow and steady disappearance of what once was one of Hollywood's most prolific and profitable subgenres, the mid-budget adult drama. In conjunction with the rise of Netflix and the slew of streaming services that followed, the separation between what quote, merited a theatrical experience and what sufficed as home viewing became clearly demarcated. If someone's running around in a cape saving the universe, it goes on the big screen. If it's about the human condition, it goes home. It's a gross generalization, of course, but one that nonetheless is almost impossible to ignore. And perhaps because of that lack of investment in a type of film that for so long represented the best of what cinema had to offer, a harmonious blend of art and entertainment, it's worth taking a look at the last great movie year and perhaps the single greatest in movie history. So without further ado, let's dive into the absolute knockout of a cinematic year that was 2007. It's perhaps wise to start by acknowledging other years that are usually mentioned when having this type of discussion. For all intents and purposes, it's hard to ignore 1939, 1976, 1994, and of course, 1999 which was a particularly strong year for American cinema, from big blockbusters and auteur-driven films, to stirring dramas and films that would eventually become cult classics. Gentlemen, welcome to Fight Club. But these years don't quite reach the heights achieved by 2007, which not only reflected the social-political troubles of the early aughts, but also proved to be a prescient year that felt a massively impactful economic crisis looming. 2007 was a year of paranoia, anxiety, and obsession. It was a year ripe for the greatest filmmakers of our time to release some of their very best work. Look no further than three of Hollywood's most convincing auteurs, the Coen brothers and Paul Thomas Anderson. We're talking about No Country for Old Men and There Will Be Blood, of course. Interestingly, both films were shot quite literally next to each other, and at one point PTA's grandiose oil explosion even impacted the Coen's shoot. It matters little, though. What remains are two flawless films about how money corrupts the soul. They turn the mirror to capitalism as perpetuated by American culture and showcase how it leaves a trail of death and destruction in its wake. While PTA and the Coens have fundamentally different life philosophies and approaches to filmmaking, No Country for Old Man and There Will Be Blood function as two sides of the same coin. They show to what great lengths men goes to find success, only to be faced with profound emptiness. If the rule you followed brought you to this, of what use was the rule? The greatest film of the year, according to many, and one of the high watermarks of the 21st century was delivered by David Fincher. Zodiac continues to awe, confound, and inspire audiences and filmmakers alike. At first, there's something almost unsatisfying about how Zodiac evolves. There are vignettes depicting short periods of time in between long stretches devoid of big events, characters come and go at a leisurely pace and sometimes just never come back, Life spans years and years with audiences never being present for milestones such as weddings and births and deaths. But in this fractured timeline lies an hypnotic quality, a deep truth. It's a purposeful choice that mirrors the exhausting, never-ending and taxing investigative process. That's why we're overwhelmed with information at all times. It comes in the form of dialogue, insert shots, and also crisp and brutal recreation. The truth is, Fincher's film is closer in nature to all the president's men than it is to his other serial killer film, Seven. Zodiac does have a serial killer at its center, but he is quite possibly the least important part of the film. He serves mostly as fuel for our protagonist's obsessions and to showcase how procedural work unfolds in such an unglamorizing way. Zodiac is by design almost anti-Hollywood. Everything is simply what it was what Tosky, Graysmith, and Avery lived, pure and unfiltered, regardless of cinematic conventions. Yet, Zodiac breeds and lives cinema. The world is vivid, richly textured, and of impressive depth. As Guillermo del Toro wrote in his now famous Twitter thread, great films, like Diamonds, sometimes require mining. Some are hard work, but their yield is precious. 
These films seldom get us at first viewing, but when repeated, they become permanent loves. In the same vein, the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, Gone Baby Gone, We Own the Night, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, Cassandra's Dream, and Eastern Promises are also films with richly textured and very specific quarrels that traffic in shadows and darkness to make compelling cases about the human condition. These works in particular are increasingly missing from the current landscape. They're adult, present compelling moral quandaries, and have their fair share of grounded but remarkably well-crafted action sequences. Notably, the naked bathhouse fight in Cronenberg's film has entered the canon of great scenes of the new century. It's raw, brutal, and just impossible to forget. The harrowing car chase sequence under pouring rain and we own the night hasn't quite reached that status, but perhaps it should. Gray ramps up the intensity by locking the POV and putting Phoenix's character in a position of complete powerlessness, which then the audience feels at a profound level. Along the same lines, Gone Baby Gone might be one of the darkest and ballsiest studio films made in the last 15 years. The intellectual and moral dynamics at play are gut-wrenching and nothing short of mesmerizing. Affleck's film has the courage to give us a hero we disagree with, only to force us to take a hard look in the mirror and realize that perhaps he's right. That is, until we're forced to question everything again with a heartbreaking final shot. It's case to say that doing the right thing is hard, but doing the moral thing even more so. Wait, you changed your name to McLovin? <clears throat> McLovin? What kind of a stupid name is that, Fogel? What are you trying to be, an Irish R&B singer? In lighter fare, it's worth highlighting the Judd Apatow machine, which was involved in two highly influential films that came out just two weeks apart from each other and marked a transformational period in comedy. These are knocked up and super bad. Both are coming of age narratives in their own ways, stamped with Apatow's unique brand of improv, and both have staying power as they continue to be rewatchable favorites 15 years later. Superbad in particular stands apart for its thoughtful and insightful writing, as well as Greg Matola's deft touch behind the camera, which elevates the film above countless others of the genre. But the comedy-adjacent world also thrived with works from great filmmakers such as Edgar Wright, Steven Soderbergh, and Wes Anderson. Arguably the high point of the Cornado trilogy, Hot Fuzz remains a deliriously funny and action-packed murder mystery inspired by 80s and 90s action movies, particularly those from Hollywood, and features Edgar Wright's trademark editing style and economical but impactful storytelling. It's a shining example of a parody and homage that sings thanks to great dialogue and clever one-liners. Forget it, Nicholas. It's some for Soderbergh's third installment in the Oceans trilogy is also an homage, but a different one. No less clever entertaining, Oceans 13 heightens the absurdity and fully embraces the camp as seen in classic TV shows like Get Smart and The Men From UNCLE. It's a parade of silly ideas and even sillier disguises and gags that work perfectly because Soderbergh is a master of tone and mood. The Darjeeling Limited is perhaps the least outwardly funny of Wes Anderson's bastard films, at least in a conventional way, but time has been kind to its reputation. It's one of his most meditative works, featuring a deceivingly profound narrative of enlightenment that never shies away from darker themes. And of course, in classic Wes fashion, the absurd laughs are never lacking. <laughs> You don't love me! Yes, I do! I love you too, but I'm going to mace you in the face! 2007 also saw two remarkable and unconventional music biopics. Todd Haynes covers six facets of Bob Dylan and the exquisite I'm Not There, and Anton Corvin cast a spotlight on the tragic life of Joy Division singer Ian Curtis in the gorgeously photographed and masterfully directed Control. These films offer an artistic alternative to the conventional music biopic, stepping away from the cradle-to-the-grave formula, instead focusing on a particular time frame and diving deep into these artists' relationships and idiosyncrasies. The result is two timeless pieces of art that remain high points of the genre. Furthermore, in Kate Blanchett we find an enormous performance, one of the century's best, as if she met Bob Dylan on the astral plane and came down completely and utterly possessed. Foreign cinema was particularly strong during 2007, from the global phenomenon that was Elite Squad to the devastating Palm d'Or winner four months, three weeks and two days, audiences were privileged enough to get wide-ranging brain-tingling experiences from masters of the form. 
Abdelatif Kashish, for example, showcased the turmoil in immigrant lives in the sensitively rendered The Secret of the Grain, and Julian Schnabel arose profound empathy with the emotionally resonant The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. After a Hollywood stint that earned him a Best Director Oscar, Ang Lee returned to his homeland to evoke lust and sensuality in the much-talked-about spy thriller Lust Caution, while J.A. Bayona gave us great and twisty genre fare with The Orphanage. Elsewhere, Vincent Parano and Marjan Satrapi delivered the touching and culturally sensitive animation with their Oscar-nominated, gorgeously rendered Persepolis, which shined a light on the realities of the post-1979 Iranian Revolution, while Carlos Regadas blew many away with his elegant and masterfully composed Silent Light. And then there was Olivier Dahan's massive crowd-pleaser La Vie en Rose, which earned Marion Cotillard a Best Actress Oscar for her portrayal of Edith Piaf. It's easy to understand just how terrific 2007 was when we reached this point in the video and we haven't yet mentioned a film like Michael Clayton, which gets better and better with every rewatch. It's both a throwback and an evolution of the legal thriller, populated with complex and damaged characters with honest, resounding narrative arcs. Plus, it features an all-time script by Tony Gilroy filled with quotable lines. I'm not a miracle worker, I'm a janitor. Another film rooted in a well-established subgenre that also disrupted expectations was Juno, which became wildly popular due to its unique brand of twee. However, the film shines mostly as a writing piece. It features characters who are fundamentally distinct, whose brains operate on different wavelengths. Yet, it's easy to understand why they are in each other's lives. Sometimes the result skews depressive, but it can also be profoundly hopeful. Diablo Cody perfected the art of creating a compelling, unique lead while giving each supporting character a chance to shine. And then there's the elegantly and intimately constructed Atonement, perhaps Joe Wright's finest film. The scene between James McAvoy and Keira Knightley in the study is stupendous, so sensually and artistically shot. It's staged in such a way that allows Wright's camera to capture the raw emotion of profound lust. The entire film hinges on that sequence and remains a ghost throughout, anchored by the weight of its beauty and feeling. And did we even talk about the big American blockbusters like American Gangster and Born Ultimatum? The truth is that the list goes on and on and on. There have been great movie years throughout film history, but as it stands, 2007 seems like it was as good as it gets, perhaps as good as it'll ever get. As highlighted in this video, no other year has quite the same depth, not only in terms of quality, but also quantity. And for those of us who are lucky enough to embrace a theatrical experience 15 years ago, even more so. It seems like every week we could have walked into a theater and be immersed in a rewarding, perhaps even transformative movie-going experience. How often has that happened? Is it even possible it'll happen again? The landscape has changed dramatically and so has the general public's relationship to movies and what does and does not merit the big screen. What lies ahead nobody really knows, although most predict a less than sunny outcome for movie lovers. But that's a subject for another video. What remains, 15 years later, is the rare cinematic year during which every sect of the population was rewarded with filmmakers and actors at the top of their game doing some of the best work of their careers.